And now is uh, the session I think uh, everybody was uh, looking for. We will see the spike. The spike President Guzzetti was uh, telling about uh, in the eyes uh, of the young people we will have very soon. So first I invite to the stage uh, Professor Yunus. Thank you. <laughs> and the Professor Jim Shore, CEO of the Social Enterprise Alliance USA and uh, also board member of the Social Enterprise Reform. Okay, thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, I've, been, I've had this date circled on my calendar for three or four months now, and I, uh, I hope you are looking forward to ending the eighth Social Enterprise World Forum um, uh, with this session all about uh, the next generation. Um, I can't think of a more fitting way to wrap up the conversation that we've had in the last three days uh, with a session taking place between the greatest social entrepreneur uh, of our time and five of the most inspiring young social entrepreneurs in the world. Um, I was having a, a bit of lunch with a couple of the young ones, not that young actually, but uh, with a couple of the youth uh, over, uh, over the break today. And they were confiding in me that they were a bit nervous about this session. And I was confiding in them that I was a bit nervous about it as well. How many times do you get to share the stage with such an amazing group of people? But with, with one of the greatest human beings of our time and five uh, emerging uh, dynamic young social entrepreneurs, uh, my response was, how could we possibly screw this up, right? <laughs> so... So I've been uh, at this work for about 20 years now, about half the time that Professor Eunice has been at this work. And uh, I'm every bit as excited and optimistic about the future of social enterprise as I was when I fell in love with the idea of it 20 years ago when Gordon Roddick's wife, Anita Roddick, the founder of The Body Shop, came to my university and spoke and implanted in me the idea of using the power of business to change the world. And my life has never been the same since. Um, but one of the things that ke keeps me, um, keeps the fire burning in me and has that fire burning even brighter than it ever has before is the growing tidal wave of uh, enthusiasm uh, among the next generation for social enterprise and, the, and, using, and this idea of using the power of business to change the world. Um, it, uh, Professor Yunus, of course, needs no introduction father of social business, founder of Grameen Bank, Nobel laureate. Each of our uh, young social entrepreneurs I'm going to introduce briefly today. Their bios, their full bios are in the, uh, on the online conference website. If you're interested in learning more, a bit more about their work, we don't have time to, to get in, into depth about bios today. But uh, in no particular order, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Fiza Farhan, from who is CEO of the Buksh Foundation in Pakistan. Uh, Sophia Grinvalds, who we've heard from earlier in the, in the event on uh, Wednesday evening, founder and managing director of AfriPads in Uganda. Guy Ryan, founder and CEO of Inspiring Stories in New Zealand, recently named the Young New Zealander, Young New Zealander of the Year. I probably don't need to say that Guy is a surfer. <laughs> well done, Guy. Uh, Rustam Sengupta, founder and CEO of Bond in India solar energy access provider. And last but not least, an Italian working in Tanzania, also on social energy issues, uh, co-founder of Devergy and CEO as in Chief Energizing Officer. 
Fabio De Pascale. I want to note as well that uh, a young woman who was supposed to be with us today, Lorna Ruto from Kenya, had a family tragedy uh, earlier in the week and can't be with us today. And I just wanted to send Lorna our collective thoughts and prayers. So our format today uh, is going to involve my posing some questions to the panelists. Um, I'm going to ask Professor Yunus to uh, give the first response to each of these questions and then invite each of the young social entrepreneurs to join, uh, to join him in a conversation about each of these questions. The questions have come from the young social entrepreneurs and uh, with any luck we'll have a bit of time, maybe 10 minutes or so at the end, to get to a few more of your questions as well. Okay? All right. So, uh, Pro Professor Yunus, my first question involves um, the growing, uh, as I mentioned, the growing awareness and enthusiasm among young people today for this, this movement of social enterprise that you have been such an inspiration um, and leader in for 40 years now. Um, inspiration, it strikes me, is a terrific thing. As, as, uh, as Peter mentioned earlier, I have the opportunity, in addition to representing the Social Enterprise Alliance in the U.S., I have the opportunity to teach at the university where Professor Yunus did his uh, Ph.D. at Vanderbilt in Tennessee. Um, and so I have the great privilege and pleasure of, uh, uh, of teaching and mentoring young social entrepreneurs all the time. And it strikes me through my teaching uh, that uh, inspiration is not enough, right? So the question, the first question I'd like to tackle is, what will it take now um, to not just inspire, but to equip and educate young people um, to uh, come together in a uh, significant way to build this movement and change the world? Professor Yunus. Well, thank you for giving this privilege of sitting all these young leaders, um, young social entrepreneurs uh, who will be looking forward to build a new world. One issue that uh, I would focus on, the young generation today, in my way of looking at it, is very different than uh, young generation of previous uh, generations. Uh, and I describe by telling the young generation that you are the most powerful generation in human history. And I explain why I say that. Um, it's not because they are intelligent, or more intelligent than their previous, or still further down the line, the generations before. They're the same people, but they're lucky to have access to enormous power of technology, which no other generation history ever had. So they, that makes them absolutely different kind of young people, young human beings. Uh, which no other human beings had. So given that, uh, they use this technology in a day-to-day -day way. They're already connected with each other much more uh, closely than any generation ever connected themselves, each other. Uh, that gives them a tremendous uh, ability to uh, communicate to each other. And the awareness that you are talking about is not something that has been imposed on them. They discover it on their own because of the way they see the world for themselves. And they are ready to build their own world. They are not just inheriting the world as it is. Uh, I think they are more tuned to create a world for themselves. And that's a very important part. Of it. it's, a, it's a sharp departure. It's not a continuous... Uh, changes over time, it's a big departure because this generation is a departure from the previous generations. Uh, in, in one generation, it's a big jump. And similarly, they see the world as a big jump also. There, the idea of social entrepreneurship, the idea of social business, these are very attractive things for them. Many universities have adopted uh, the idea of social business as a coursework for them. And many have set up social business centers. The reason I mentioned it, in most of the cases that I heard about, it is not the initiative of the university itself. It was the initiative from the young people, from the students, 
challenging the university, saying, why don't you teach us? If it is so important, if it's in, uh, such a grand thing that uh, we feel, uh, and we don't know what it's all about. So because of their demand, they created these institutes, chairs, centers, and so on. So this is a big thing that the students demanding, they want to learn more about it. So that's the generation this group here is representing. I see tremendous hope. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great uh, uh, example. The, uh, just on a personal note, I uh, was origi originally, all of my teaching was at the graduate level, at the MBA level. And the, the undergrads decided that they wanted a course, they were trying to audit the MBA course and the, and the right. graduate program wouldn't let them audit the course. Yeah. So I told one of the young people that was trying to audit the course to prove that there was enough interest in having a social on enterprise course for young, for, at the undergraduate level. And, uh, and then I would go through the administrative processes right. once the demand had been proven. And within three days, there were 440 students on a Facebook page that had been set up called Social Enterprise at Vanderbilt. Right. Um, 440 undergrads had signed up and saying, yes, we want this course. Sure. So to your point about technology, to your point about the, the grassroots level um, um, communication um, power well. right, of the young people today, sure. uh, uh, another example. Right. Who would like to build on uh, Professor Eunice's uh, comments there? Please, Fiza. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, is the mic working? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so just to build on what Professor Yunus said, I think um, one very key thing to include the social entrepreneurs, potential so so social entrepreneurs in the next generation in this movement is by demonstration. And by sharing that demonstration with them by experience, uh, by case studies, and by making them meet and talk to and relate to entrepreneurs like us, the senior, very, very senior entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. of course, um, so that academia does not always um, sort of give answers to all the challenges that are in their mind. It doesn't uh, give real answers to the limitations they think, you know, the, the risk of failure, the fears, the hesitations that they have before plunging into the sector. And secondly, uh, the more I talk to, I go to a lot of universities in Pakistan now, um, giving mentoring sessions to the graduating batch, especially the girls. Uh, telling them about what they can do in social entrepreneurship, unveil their potential. And I feel that uh, the awareness of social entrepreneurship has also to be created. Because they usually feel that, you know, we're graduates from Stanford or, or whatever, Lums or Warwick or Yale. Um, but we don't want to set up an NGO. We don't want to, we, we want to do something, investment banking, Wall Street. You know, they have very big, high billion dollar dreams. You need to make them understand that social entrepreneurship is something whereby a lot of good can be derived environmentally, socially, and financially as well, if coupled in the right way and with the right spirit. So perhaps the awareness and then the demonstration with real life examples will enable them and motivate them to convert their ideas to realities. Yeah. That's it, very good. Thank you. Yes. Guy, please. Oh, you have a... Yeah. All right. Um, so, I mean, we're living in a, in a time where we have the opportunity to completely transform the world in which we live. Like Professor Yunus said, you know, technology enables us to learn from um, some of the most innovative initiatives on the planet. And indeed, the challenges that we face are global challenges, but they're also local challenges as well. I believe that, at least in New Zealand, what I can speak for is that our education system is failing to prepare our young people for the challenges of the 21st century. More than ever, we need to be supporting our young people to understand these complex global issues to look and understand proven initiatives, proven enterprises, proven examples that are making a difference, learn how, to replicate, learn how to replicate them to build their capability and back them to make it happen. I think we have to be um, relentlessly optimistic for young people and back them to be the change that they want to see in the world. Fantastic, Guy, thanks. Fabio, please. So um, building on what yeah. Professor Yunus, Fiza, and Gay said, uh, I come from a country where the average age of uh, people there is 27. So um, it's everybody's, nearly everybody's young. Um, we are talking of a huge demographics of people who are young, who are now cognizant of what's happening in the world, and who are also very, very aggressively optimistic about how they want to control their future. So social businesses 
are not just uh, cannot just be a fad for the MBA schools and the English speaking educated upper middle class people like ourselves, but has to go and hit them and actually go through that layer. Uh, and that's where I think what is the next generation, it has to break through that mold of English speaking upper educated people becoming social entrepreneurs to everybody who has an enterprise at the last mile, identifying himself for the greater good of what he's doing rather than just earning money. Uh, I think the past generation was a stability generation. My father, I take this opportunity, was from the border between Bangladesh and India. And he entered a, as a refugee in New Delhi. And so the first thing he thought about was providing for himself and his kids and making them grow. But our generation can break that shackle and we can think around and we can grow much further and much faster. Um, so I think that's our take on the news. That's, that's such a big idea, Rustam. I'm just... Such a big and important idea. I'm curious to know, do you, do, do you have any thoughts about how we can, how we can make that, that, bridge that gap, bridge that divide from social entrepreneurship being something that's a product of the, the relatively well-to-do? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's three clear things you can do. Yeah. Number one, forums this, like these have to open up and go one level lower or much level lower so that they can, you know, they can hear Professor Yunus. I mean, they, they don't right now. Uh, number two, the education system, and Indian education is much worse, much, much worse than New Zealand, I'm sure, uh, needs to sensitize the students from a very early age about the society around them, about the common areas. We, we keep our house clean and throw the garbage outside. And that's something you need to learn when you're three years old. So that starts, that's number two. And number three, the businesses and the people who have money have to realize that the rate at which they're uh, I'm, I want, I'm not even saying capitalism, the rate at which they're growing, the greed has to stop at some point. Their children cannot leave the planet. They'll have to stay in the same planet. And in a country like India, you have a house in Mumbai, which is 34 stories for four people, whereas there is a slum night next door where 34 people stay in one four by four cluster. At some point, these people will rise and snatch it from you if you don't realize that now. Beautiful, thank you. Fabio, do you have thoughts on this? Yes, so just actually building up exactly on this point, I think uh, we, um, we have the opportunity today to start being a bit more inclusive, in, in particular uh, to all the people that actually live and uh, uh, grew and grew up in the, in the countries where we're mostly working. So um, I always think, how do we bridge that divide? So the language divide is an obvious one, mm -hmm. but also the network divide. It's actually, even today, is actually different to be coming from uh, you know, Stanford MBA in social enterprises or not. Because if you're there, you're gonna be exposed to uh, you know, the investment network and so on. It will just you know, give you that kickstart. And, that's, and nevertheless, you know, some of us not coming maybe from that background, nevertheless made it. But the reality is if you're coming instead from a village, I know Tanzania very well, but a village in Tanzania, a village in Uganda, a village in anywhere in the world, you just will never make it to that point because the number of barriers between you and that level is so huge. So why don't we start working on local incubators? Why don't we start working on, on communities that can help local talents be developed and grow and access networks and access knowledge? And, and maybe, you know, over time, maybe they will actually learn English, but at least they should have the ability to start this path, this this uh, road without that uh, being a barrier. I think that's a bit, uh, it's something that we can definitely do. And then we have another uh, two, three billion people that could you know, participate and, and be together with us in 10 years. It's, uh, I think that's a bit limiting today. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Sophia, uh, I know all of us that were, had a chance to be in the room on Wednesday evening when you, had a, when you, uh, when you did a talk and told us about your own story, as well as the story of Afropads, were inspired by what we heard. How do we, you know, build, you know, reframing this question in a bit of a different way, right? How do we get to a point where, what you, where your path, right, is far, far, you know, far more the norm, right, among young people these days? How, do, how, does, the, how does your story become uh, uh, the story of a generation? 
Yeah, thank you. I think that um, I'd really like to, to build on Fabio's point. You know, my personal experience has been in the, in the Ugandan context, and I think that one of the things that I see personally is um, they don't have, the, the entrepreneurs are there. They're there um, from the person who's selling something at a kiosk to someone selling something on the side of the road, and they have ideas, they are creative, but part of what we discussed in the earlier session was about knowledge and power. And if you don't have access to, to knowledge, if you don't know and understand that there's this growing uh, empire of a movement of social enterprise, it's hard to engage in it knowingly and aware. And I think that as an entrepreneur, one of the things we need to know is what do we need? We need to know our needs very well. And part of that comes with that power. And so I think that when we look at forums like this, they're an excellent opportunity and, and a privileged opportunity for someone like myself coming from Uganda to, to learn and to build my network. But in Uganda, what I would love to see are more young entrepreneurs, more Ugandan entrepreneurs who are able to build their businesses and their ideas. And at the moment, they lack the same access to network, to technology, um, to this inclusive environment that we're in right now. And I think that that's a really important issue to look at moving forward. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm curious, um, the idea of technology, right, has come up as, a, uh, as, as a, a reason why the potential for this generation is um, exponentially um, different, right, than it's been in the past. Um, I'm curious to explore the idea of, you know, we, we come to an event like this and the 700 or 800 of us or so that are in the room today or have been for the last couple of days have a very privileged sort of situation, right? We get to uh, meet people and hear stories about that inspire us, about things that are being done in other parts of the world, all over the world. We get to share learnings, we get to build networks, we get to all these things, but, but those advantages are derived by relatively few, right? And so I'm curious to hear thoughts about how perhaps we can um, leverage technology or perhaps other mechanisms to create more of a global community around social entrepreneurship, particularly for young people, um, where best ideas and best practices um, can be shared in a, in a more, uh, in a, on, a, on a bigger scale, right, than, than we're able to do in an event like this that only, we're with rooms that only hold um, so many people. Eunice, would you like to start, please? Yeah, you uh, already emphasized that point, that technology is power. Uh, when you put the power of the youth and power of technology, put them together, it becomes explosive. Uh, this is what is happening and will continue to happen. Uh, but up to now, uh, what we call technology is a technology which is commanded by money makers and war makers. That's the one who guide the technology because there is no other driver in the scene. Uh, technology is like a car or a vehicle. Uh, it's very efficient to take you wherever you want to take, but it's the driver who decides where to go. So today the driver of technology is either the money maker or the war maker. There is no social driver sitting on top of it to take it to the social direction. So that's what the new generation can do, that the, we are the one who want to change the world and we want to create the technology which is uh, appropriate for that not some silly technology, make big money out of it, uh, not like that. Technology is something which can be designed, shaped the way you want. Technology's power is to solve problem for you. Uh, and I keep telling uh, for many years, I said what the technology should be coming up now would be creating an Aladdin's lamp. Uh, like in uh, Arabian Nights, Aladdin lamp, you touch the lamp and the genie comes out of it and say, what can I do for you? Then you say, you do it for me and it is done. You say, yes, master, it will be done and it is done. I said, today we have an opportunity to make it happen. If our mind is in that direction, create a Aladdin's lamp of technology and you touch that Aladdin's lamp, and digital genie comes out of it. 
and say, what do you want me to do? And you say what you want to do, get done, and it will be done. And I've been saying that for many years. Now I say that that Aladdin's lamp is already created, already done. It's our mobile phone. You touch it, it gets done. You need the right kind of app into it. You want the temperature, you want the weather, you want the restaurant, you want the menu, you want the review or whatever you want. You want the direction. Whatever people thought I need, the wishes of the people, that becomes the app. And all you have to do is a touch and it gets done. So, so we have to get it done. What kind of health problem I have? Yeah, this is your problem. They will tell you right away. All your body information can be in, inside that little gadget. It continuously trans, transmitting all the information to a, with the cloud. Your body information is there. They're monitoring it every second. If there is a kind of mismatch in your body, something is happening, which may turn into a serious disease 10 years later, 15 years later. But they identify it right now. So that prevention can become the healthcare not the cure. Cure is too far down the line, it's all obsolete, mm. that we don't want to go that far. We want to identify right now. The reason I'm mentioning it's possible, it's not something uh, kind of fancy idea. What young people should be doing is not technology yet, it's the imagination first. Mm. Imagination is the key to the technology. I give the example of science fiction. Everybody loves science fiction. You want to go to the galaxy, you want to go to super speed, and something happens right away. We love to watch. We love to read, we love to watch the television show, movies, and so on. The fantastic thing about science fiction, you make crazy ideas, crazy imaginations. But that crazy imagination excites technologists. They design technology to make it happen. So technology is always following science fiction. Unfortunately, we are not creating social fictions. Fictions of the world that we would like to see, something which doesn't exist now, but imagining world is, in our imagination, a perfect world, where we design it, we have a television show, we have a radio show, we have books, we have series, and so on, so that the young people start imagining that. My point is, if the young people start imagining that, it will happen, because it, they will come with the technology to make it happen. So that's the thing, that our education system doesn't encourage imagination. That's the key to the human beings. Imagine. The more you imagine, it will happen. If you do not imagine, it will not happen. I love the idea of uh, dreaming it into being. Um, you know, Guy, you've, you've started something in New Zealand that's called the Festival for the Future, which is engaging 400 or so um, young people in New Zealand in, on, on an idea that is very much builds on um, what Professor Yunus just had to say, right? This, uh, this idea of encouraging young New Zealanders to dream big. And I'm curious to know how his comments resonate with you and, and perhaps what thoughts you might add to this idea of you've created this sort of community in New Zealand, right? Um, what are your thoughts on this idea of the community uh, in, a more, uh, in a more global way? Uh, so I guess um, technology is an enabler, right? You know, technology enables us to um, design smarter systems and processes. But um, first and foremost, I do think it comes down to what we do with it. It comes down to imagination, you know, what's the purpose that we put behind this technology? Um, I guess, you know, um, in New Zealand broadly, we talk about supporting young people on this journey from inspiration to action. And inspiration is important because the opposite of inspiration is disempowerment and despair and a lack of hope, which completely cripples people. And when people are inspired, they will go above and beyond the line to make a difference. I think, I think one of the big challenges of our time is leadership. You know, I think in the, in the context of these big global issues that we face, how do we hold ourselves more accountable to be fairer, to be more inclusive? You know, all of these qualities that we can imagine and we want to see in the new world, and how do we hold our leaders accountable 
to step up and also deliver on those things. So I guess I'm really interested in the conversation of how do we take the essence of what we've um, discussed and had conversations about over this weekend and take it on a much bigger scale. You know, 800 people in a room, what does it take to get this stuff to 8 million people, 8 billion people, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the challenge of our generation. Yeah. And um, I guess I'm uh, also conscious of the fact that as young people, whilst we are... Um, on the cusp of being at this interface between technology and wanting to make a difference and um, you know, having huge optimism and drive, we don't have all the answers. And absolutely we need the, the wisdom and experience of the older generation to draw on. Yeah. It's yeah. For me. It starts with imagination, right? As the professor said. Um, so congratulations on having dreamed this festival for the future into being in New, in New Zealand. Yeah. Does anyone else have thoughts on this, on this notion of global community and what we can do and how that's important? And yeah, please, Fiza. Um, just yeah. a small thought. Yeah. We've already yeah. had such yeah. wonderful ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel that for, of course, technology, we've established how it's, uh, it's critical for a global community. Yeah. And technology is enabling and empowering. Um, but there, are, there is a very large chunk of uh, population, especially in countries, developing countries like Pakistan and India, that does not even have access to this technology. Um, so thereby, I feel that those of us all around, all sitting here, who have, who are privileged to be a part of this network, to be a part of this discussion, this wisdom, technology, are also responsible to share and trickle down those benefits to those communities and create similar entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial spirit within those ruler masses, so that they can further trickle down to the poorest of the poor. Uh, and this has been the key success uh, enabler of our business models in uh, Buck's Foundation, mm. whereby we create energy entrepreneurs, women energy entrepreneurs, in rural areas who become the agent of change, enabling access to energy to the villagers. Mm. So this, this model of enabling, ena creating enablers and allowing them to enable further will finally help us all achieve the global community Thanks. eventually. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Faisal. We are in the mode of a lot of clapping. Might as well stick with it, huh? The, uh, so I'm curious to get some, I'm, 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 we've got such an interesting group of people here that I want to get some advice from you all, right? I want to I get, um, get Professor Eunice's wisdom and advice for you all. Yeah, maybe the, the, the most important thing that Professor Eunice could, could say to the next generation about um, uh, using your life in this fashion, right, to uh, uh, make the world a, um, a more just place. And I want to get some advice from you all um, for the current generation, right, or the, you know, the, the generation that's on its, you know, that's uh, on its way out if you're, on, if you're the generation that's on its way in. What should, you know, how can we um, be more supportive? Um, how can we be more? Someone mentioned the idea of connections, right? Often, I find that often we talk about youth, and we and we talk about them in a sort of in a in a separate sort of way, right? And there is Professor Eunice is probably the best example, but there are many examples of current generation um, social entrepreneurs that have have learned, have made many, many have had many successes and many failures, and there's a lot of learning for us to share, right? So how do we? Um, broker, foster, right, more connections between the next generation and the current generation for that sort of knowledge transfer and, and, uh, and share. So advice, uh, we'll start with Professor Eunice again, advice perhaps for the next generation, Professor, um, and then to each of you all, what's your uh, single biggest piece of advice for, um, for those of us that are a bit older um, and how we can, um, how we can be more uh, supportive and empowering of the next generation? Well, I'll start with uh, following up with what I said earlier. Is it working? Yeah. Uh, f what I said earlier about the imagination. Uh, I would say the young people to reflect, uh, to see uh, what are the problems they see around the world right now. And so that they have an understanding of the problem that they have. Just make at least one, two, three, just one word, two words kind of thing. And then imagining a world what they would like to create in imagination. They don't have to really do it if, if they don't feel like it, but imagination, wild imagination, this is the kind of world we want. 
and features of that world. This is what we want that world to be, one, two, three, four, and hang it up in the world. And I say that if you just can figure it out, imagination, put them on a piece of paper, hang it up, that world will happen. Because we all figured it out what we want. It's if more and more people thinking in the same direction, it will start happening. So what I do to, to myself, I have a list for myself when I come to continue to explain it, what I have in mind. I said I want to create a world of three zeros. Zero poverty, that world will not have any poverty at all. Not a single person will be known as a poor person. There isn't, isn't any. And we'll have poverty museums where people can go and see what poverty used to be like. So that it's gone, finish. And we are on the track of it today, when we see the MDG goal number one, reducing poverty by half and all that. So that's the direction, but we want to go up to the zero poverty. Not a single person, or anywhere in the world, exists who is a poor person. The second zero is the zero unemployment. There's nobody in the world who is unemployed, because this is such an artificial idea, be unemployed. And in that world, the word unemployment become unemployed. It has no word, no use for that word anymore because people don't even understand what is unemployment is. How can an able-bodied human being remain idle, sit down, doing nothing, as if somebody has put a spell on that person? There's no reason why anybody should spell on us. We are human beings. We are creative beings. We do things on our own. We don't wait for anybody's decision. So that's the world that we are looking for. Nobody would be unemployed because it's, a, it does, it's not part of human being. Number three, zero number three is zero carbon emission, net zero carbon emission. So that way we have a safer planet for ourselves. And I put four basic strategies to achieve these three zeros. One is the youth. They are the one who really make this happen. Second, technology, which we discussed. Youth and technology together becomes very powerful. Third, social business. Because we have to push the social idea into the picture. Otherwise, it will be gone with the money makers and war makers and all those people. So we need to take control of life, control of ourselves, that this is what we are. We are human beings. We want to create things in our own way, not because my satisfaction. It is for the rest of the world. This is what we do, social business. And the fourth, is a good governance and human rights, ensuring human rights and good governance. If you can put all these four together, it will be much easier to achieve those three that we put together. I can think I speak for all of us in saying that's exactly the kind of world we want to live in. So it's a beautiful vision. Um, so I, I asked you all to, to um, give us a piece of advice. You can, it, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to have run out of time here very soon. So previously I had also su suggested that we, you offer a closing thought, perhaps an inspirational story or whatever, whatever, um, whatever however you want to wrap this up. But think about this as the, the thought with which you want to leave this audience, whether it's a piece of advice or a parting thought or a story from your work or whatever it might be. Guy, it looks like you're ready to go. Burning, burning yeah. question. Yeah. Um, can I just add a, a fifth point to Muhammad Yunus's strategy to change the world there? Um, I, I think it's story, you know. I think story is such a powerful thing. Stories shape our attitudes, our beliefs. You know, stories are what gives us hope and believe that this change that we want to see is possible. I think one of the challenges is that all of us need to be great orators, you know. All of us need to be... Um, redefining what it means for our generation. What is this opportunity? You know, the generation that, that did change the world. What is the new narrative that we want to create and share with the world? And how do we do that in a really powerful way where we can get up, where we can engage thousands of people face-to-face -face through great oratory, where we can share those stories online and engage a much broader audience, um, as well, of course, as the first four points as well, I think, are yeah. really vital. That's the piece of advice that I would add. Beautiful. Sure. Thanks, Guy. Please, Sophia. Yeah, I'd like to say that, you know, this has been an incredible couple of days here, and I think that one of the reasons why we are all here and why we're committed 
uh, to what we're doing is because we believe in better. We believe that the world can be a better place, and not just can be a better place, but it has to change. It has to be a better place. And what we've seen is that business has that power. Business has the potential, social business, social enterprise, to truly change and transform the world. But what we need now is to trickle down all of this information that we're gathering, all the lessons, all the challenges that we're experiencing. And we need to share these tools. We need to share this information. And part of that, Guy is absolutely correct, it comes through storytelling, it comes through technology. And if we can build this toolbox and, and share that, not just with the people who are able to sit in rooms like this and everyone who's able to access the internet, but if we can bring that down to the level where we have people living in poverty on a daily basis, but who are entrepreneurs in and of themselves, I think we can really change the world. Awesome. Fabio. So, um, I, think, I think there is one thing that I, I realized at some point that um, we, in Devagy, we were uh, three co-founders at the beginning and we had this amazing peculiarity. None of us had ever worked uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, the development, the cooperation and all that. And in fact, we had never set foot in Africa and yet we were planning a, an enterprise in Africa, which makes absolutely no sense. And yet, we did it because we didn't know there was nonsensical. And, uh, and then we kept doing new things that um, we just thought, why not? And other people were like, this makes absolutely no sense. And yet, we are here today uh, telling a bit of a story in that sense. Um, I, I feel that failure is, failure is hard to take. Failure is something that takes a toll every time. And it's very often one has a feeling that, OK, I failed enough. I don't need to do this again. And yet. Um, well, let's fail more. Be naive. No, don't be stupid. Just be naive. Um, go with things that, uh, that maybe makes no sense, but there is a way to make a sense out of them. There is a way to, um, you know, to find a new way to do things is uh, something that maybe, just because of how you don't know it's impossible would make it possible. And that's, that's something I feel that it's, uh, it's very important. And, and, you know, being here for us, I think, it's really about... Uh, uh, you know, all of us, I believe, are, uh, you know, have things to do, and this is not directly uh, giving a, a direct improvement to our companies, for instance. And yet, we are here because it makes sense to help out the sector, help help everybody in this room be better for tomorrow, and have more social enterprise and more social entrepreneurs, and and more of this happening. And so, I think th the thing is really just be naive, go around and and talk with people and and help someone who's trying after you. Don't tell them no, it doesn't work. Tell them, oh yeah, well actually, I really think this is, mm, but why don't you give it a shot? It's a good idea, and come back and we discuss again. Thanks, Fabio. Please. Visa, please, yes. Okay, so um, I have two things to say and then a little story to uh, share. First, I think what uh, we would, the support that this generation of social entrepreneurs would need from the wisdom that we have around. Uh, of course, we, successes are widely known. Uh, they get to be heard, they get to be shared. But I think what really needs to be shared are failures. Uh, because social entrepreneurship is a very troubled path. It's not always uh, a bed of roses. There are a lot of challenges that come. And while we all share our good stories, while we all share our, our positive outcomes and the results, uh, the failures must be shared so that once somebody has made a mistake, uh, you know, others can save their time on making, on repeating that mistake and move faster on the path of social entrepreneurship. So I really think that although the positive uh, successes and outcomes are celebrated very often, the failures uh, should be shared as lessons so that those lessons become a, a foundation for the next generation of social entrepreneurs to build mm -hmm. firmly on. Um, secondly, I think I, I, one, one piece of advice that I would really like to share with all the social entrepreneurs, potential, existing and future, sitting in this room and everywhere else, and this comes from my personal experience and my example, is to follow your heart, is to follow your belief, your passion, your own story. Everybody has their own essence, their own strengths, and their own beliefs, and their own stories. It doesn't matter if it ever existed, or nobody believes it can ever exist. But if you believe it can, then that is your foundation of your social entrepreneur. Just go for it. 
uh, because many people I see are, are struggling with the concept of social entrepreneurship because they are trying to replicate somebody else's passion and not following their own. Um, so just completely always, always believe in whatever new thing that you think can contribute your strength to this world and can make, help you make this world a better place. And within that lies your passion and within that lies your social entrepreneurship. Now, a very small anecdote I would like to share, a very small story. Um, and this, this really helped me believe in the power of social entrepreneurship and the power of belief. Um, a couple of years ago, when Malala Yousafzai from Pakistan was, uh, was, was awarded the, um, the Forbes 30 under 30 social entrepreneurship title, I used to, and at that point, we were just working with social entrepreneurship, creating our light ladies and scaling that up. And I used to just tell my family and friends that, you know, I believe that the work I'm doing is deserving of this, and I believe that I'm going to make it one day. And they used to laugh at it. They used to actually laugh it off. Uh, I've had many laughters of the same nature. And, uh, and then this year, when finally our, so our, our Lighting a Million Lives reached that point that Forbes acknowledged it with the social entrepreneurship 30 under 30, and I was the next one after Malala, it was, it was I, I just sort of you know, the belief completely warmed up inside me. And I just felt that I need to share this with everybody, that if you believe in something, just go for it and do it. No matter how insane it might sound, just do it. And within that lies your success, truly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, just a quick thought, Rustam. The, uh, I was far too old uh, when, the Forbes, when Forbes finally decided to include social entrepreneurship in their 30 under 30 list, but I, can't, but I was every bit as excited about it as you were, perhaps, right? To see Forbes magazine, which is hardly a, mag a, prog a magazine of progressivism in the, in, in the United States in business, right? Come include social entrepreneurship among their 30 under 30 categories was, I thought, a real, a real reflection of how far this, this movement has come, you know? Beautiful, thanks. Yes, Rasul. Um, unlike my beautiful colleague from Pakistan, I just do it because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, unfortunately, I don't think they gave me 30. Is there a 40 under 40? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I just, it's just so much fun. Uh, I just get to work with people I want to work with. I have a level of energy that can be tolerated and reciprocated by my team. Uh, and we actually do something that we are proud of. I used to work as, uh, in a bank before and a consultant before. Um, and sometimes I made millionaires into billionaires and I was never proud when I went to bed. But it's so much fun and it's, you see your, you, the results are right tangibly in front of you. And I think that's the best driving force. Um, unfortunately, I was a reluctant entrepreneur. I didn't really want to. I'm a Bengali, and Bengalis are not very good entrepreneurs. They're good poets. Uh, <laughs> but we, you know, we, we, we decided, I mean, it just happened that, you know, you do something, you solve the problem, you have fun, you attract people, and now we attracted a beautiful lady like Elena two years ago, and you get capital, and suddenly you are in business. You're doing something you love. There's nothing better than that. For the people who are not entrepreneurs, uh, I have a small advice. That's empathy. Please, please stop telling other people what you could have done better with their models. Uh, it's, it's, it's this beautiful habit that all of us have is the moment the other person starts speaking, we start thinking and we tell him, oh, but you know, my uncle's younger son's nephew actually also had the same thing that he did like this. You should talk to him. Uh, connections are great, networks are great, but I, I need time to work on the field. So I'd, uh, so have empathy, have empathy for the other guy. I, I agree completely with you. If you don't agree with what you're saying, if he's going to hit the wall, let him hit it. I mean, that's fine, right? I mean, it's better than everybody sitting and watching other people. So that's uh, for everybody who's not an entrepreneur, please. And, and uh, my concluding remarks, my concluding remarks since I'd prepared them uh, an hour back. Uh, why do I do social, why do we need to do, have social enterprise, how do we need and what? Uh, why I spoke about it, demographics are huge, they are young people, um, they need social solutions. But how? I mean, there's a good example. Uh, involving such beautiful volunteers who showed up in the sun outside for the past three days serving us water and juice, yeah. all the Accra volunteers with green t-shirts showing us the way. That's how you do it. That's how you involve the younger community, um, you know, the people who are interested to come and join you and actually see you. And they did such an amazing job, I think. We should. Yeah.
Uh, and, uh, and, and what does social entrepreneurship give you? I mean, look, I'm sitting with somebody from where my ancestors came from and a lady from Pakistan on the same dais. And I'm Indian. Even our finance minister didn't have that pleasure. So that's, <laughs> what, that's, that's what social enterprise does to you. It creates this world where there is no distinction after a while. I connect with her more than I connect with my capitalist colleagues sitting back home. And that's the language that people like uh, Professor Yunus has created and people like us, who obviously are not very innovative, but can be great loudspeakers for. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Very well said. Um, I'd, I'd like to begin to bring this to a close with uh, a quote that one of my former students in my first class I ever taught used as his, in his signature file on his emails. Um, and the quote, uh, the quote goes, we are not here merely to make a living. We are here to enrich the world and we impoverish ourselves when we forget this errand. Uh, I think that quote reflects the lives uh, of all, everyone in this room, not just the people on the stage, um, doing our best to enrich the world um, and not letting, us, not letting ourselves fall prey to the notion of impoverishing ourselves by forgetting that errand. Um, I'd like to uh, close by um, just saying to Professor Eunice what a great honor it is to be on the stage you. with you. Um, it's every bit as much of a pleasure to be on the stage with these young people um, but Professor Yunus, it's uh, it is truly an honor and a pleasure to have had it for all of us. I think I, to have had a chance to share this stage with you today. Um, so with that, uh, I will say thanks very much to you all. Um, we, I wish we had had time, more time for your questions, but as you have seen, we've been running a bit behind this afternoon, so we're not going to do that. Um, please join me in a final salute to Professor Yunus and to. <laughs> Fiza, Sophia, Guy, Rustam, and Fabio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.